So welcome to the first episode in our brand new series, Supercars 101. Now we totally get that this sport is complex, it's technical. In fact, you know, I say stuff sometimes I don't even understand myself. And I was gonna talk into this, and I thought that was, my... seriously, hello. <laughs> so we're gonna break it down. We're gonna get back to basics. So if you're new to the sport, this is for you. And today, we're gonna start right at the top. What is a supercar? Supercars 101, brought to you by NTI, Australia's specialist insurer. So exactly what is a supercar? Well, there's a modern one right there, and they are a very cool beast. In fact, so cool, drivers all around the world aspire to drive and race these cars. They're that unique. But before we talk about the modern supercar, I think we've got to go backwards and understand how we arrived here. How did the cars emerge? Well, you've got to go back to the early 60s, first Australian touring car race ever was a little place called Nublar on the outskirts of Orange in New South Wales. The race was won by David McKay in a Jaguar. Now, I think it's kind of sad that the first Australian touring car race is won by a Pommy Jaguar. Pretty car though, got to admit. Anyway, didn't take long, 1965 in fact, before we start to see the emergence of the V8, because we love the V8 engine in Australian racing. And Norm Beach, you can see here in a notchback Mustang, starts winning races. Now all of these championships at this point of time were modified type sedans, and they started to get really tough and muscular by the late 60s, early 70s. You know, the big Mustang versus the Camaro. And you started to get these big rivalries start to emerge with these muscular cars. Norm Beachy, Bob Jane, Alan Moffat. I mean, this was a golden era of our racing. But at the same time, up there at Mount Panorama, Bathurst started to become really important for what were called series production cars. Cars that you could buy on the showroom floor. Now, this was different. And Ford rocked up in 1967 with this, a GT, and they won the race. So that started the war because the very next year, Holden respond with a V8 two-door Monaro and win the race. So right there, the Holden versus Ford war that would go on forever emerged. And then the cars just got better. The big Falcon GT HOs, the two-door coupes, the hardtops, the Commodores, Brocky, look at that in the big banger. Then we went to different regulations that saw some European cars come in, some BMWs. That didn't last long because again, we wanted to get back here in Australia. We got back in 93, 94 to the big V8 in the four-door Australian passenger car. It's just what we do. And those rivalries have emerged. Brock Johnson, Scafey, Ambrose, Craig Lowndes, Mark Winterbottom, Jamie Winkup. This has all very much been Ford versus Holden that has been the mantra of everything we do. And then we have great rivalry that emerged from that, the Ford versus Holden rivalry. And I guess if I try and compare that to something you can see there, it is like State of Origin. It is like the Poms versus the Aussies in cricket. It is the All Blacks versus the Wallabies. And it's a funny old thing, isn't it? GMH Holden or Ford. I'm a Ford guy, not because I drove one as a young bloke. In fact, I had Holdens, but my dad drove Ford, so I was a Ford guy. So kids, go and have a look in the old photo album. See what Nan and Pop were driving, and maybe that's where your allegiance is. And as we go forward, the story continues. This is really exciting from next year, or in next year, we're going to introduce what's called Gen 3. And isn't that funny? You've got to go right back more than 50 years, Camaro versus Mustang with V8 in them again. Got to love it. Let's go and have a look at the real thing. So here we have a Commodore supercar, current supercar. Now, when we look at the car and we try and identify what's really different about this and your road-going Commodore, well, externally the surfaces are very similar. We do a lot of work in supercars to make sure what we call the wind-licked surfaces of the car, to the extent possible, replicate the road car. That's pretty cool. But what you notice, the difference between your panels at home and any panel on this race car, look at that, knock, 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 knock. They're all lightweight composites. This thing's built to weigh nothing, but it still weighs a lot. I mean, the equivalent Commodore would weigh 1.6 to 1.8 tonnes based on what you've got bolted into the thing. This particular car will weigh closer to 1,400, or let's say a tonne and a half with a driver and some fuel on board. So although it's built with all those lightweight panels, it's still quite heavy because it's got big, robust, heavy brakes, big, heavy engine, big gearbox components. It's got a roll cage in it, right? Big axles. Everything's big to be punished 
for racing. Now, a couple of other things when we look at it. I knocked on these windows before. They don't wind up and down, they're locked in. That's why you see these little vents in here to allow some airflow into the driver. And inside there on a hot day like today can get somewhere between 50 and 60 degrees centigrade. So when we say our drivers are athletes, they are. They are punishing these cars and themselves lap after lap. Not unusual to lose four litres of fluid. And then you notice we use these regulation alloy rims, but look at this, one wheel nut, not five or six like your road car. And that's not designed to hold it on there tighter, it's actually designed to get it off quicker so we can do a pit stop in three or four seconds. Now the other really big difference is this, we've got a big wing on the rear of the car and if you come up the front you'll see we've got a big aerodynamic device on the front of the car and that simply means downforce. The faster this car goes the more the air pushes down like an inverted aeroplane if you like. Now when I talk bodywork, I'm not talking about this guy down here, a couple extra horsepower down there, eh? But what's funny, when you lift up the bonnet, first of all you notice, look at these locking pins. There's no little pull catch inside like your road car, these lock it down so it can't blow up at high speed. And of course it doesn't stay up as you'd expect like your road car. You have to put this little pole in here and there we go. And there's our donk. Well, there's not our donk because you can't see it. The first thing you notice it's different. Got this massive big air box here, which is on every car. And the reason they do that at the front of our car here is these big inlets, right? So this centre one up here, that'll go up and that's taken air into that air box. So we can try and get some air pressure in there. That's power. And on either side of that is more airflow to go up into big radiators to keep that big engine cool in there. And then on the outside of that, you see here, these are the big ducts that cool our brakes and we see we play with those a lot, we play with all of these, blanking them, unblanking them, because the more we can blank them off, the faster, the more downforce the car makes. But we can't do that because we've got to try and cool everything down. Because up here, this big heat pump, this big engine, this V8, is making in old numbers, which we use, about 650 horsepower, about 460, 470 foot-pounds of torque. What's that mean in the real world? It's a lot. Probably, I don't know, four, five, maybe six times the little buzz box you're getting around in the city in. It's that powerful. <laughs> Whoa, as you can see, that's nothing like getting into your road car. Straight away, you'll notice look at this environment I'm sitting in. I'm way back further. Look at this, there's the center pillar of the car there. I'm way back. In fact, I'm probably sitting around where the passenger legs would be in a normal road car. I'm sitting really low, my butt is nearly on the floor. And the other thing is I'm sitting well inboard. Look at that, I'm probably, I don't know, 350 mil inboard of that door there. That's for safety, I'm a long way in. So, a couple of observations in the cockpit. First of all, let's talk about safety because it's a really important one. Over my shoulder here, I've got harnesses and you hear them called six point harnesses because they're here around my waist, and there's the other buckle comes up through my crutch, which has got two belts on it. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That's a six-point harness. Compulsory now, I've got these wings on my seat, so they protect me in a side impact. On my helmet, which we'll show you in a later series, we've got what's called a frontal head restraint, which in a frontal impact stops my head going forward and doing like a basal skull fracture injury, which can, it can be fatal. It has been. And of course, from a safety point of view, you can see I'm completely and utterly surrounded by a really complex roll cage, which does two things. One, offers me protection, but also gives the car enormous torsional stiffness, which is critical for a race car. So essentially where I sit in the car now, I've got protection from kind of 360 degrees in impacts, and that's really great for safety. So as fast as these cars go, they truly are very, very safe. And the other big change in more recent years regarding safety is see these big carbon fibre panels here. I've got them on this side, and I've got them on this side, and they're encapsulating my legs, because remember the big crash, Shaz Mostert at Bathurst a few years ago. Oh, big, big, big moment, a massive moment for one of the Pepsi Max cars. Into Car the wall, six. out of business for Chaz Mostert. The reigning champion has had a monumental crash. This will be a red flag. 
Chaz did a lot of damage to his left leg because it was free and flapping around and he damaged it on the levers and the centre console here. So we've got those there. And on the outside here, we've got a big panel there and a lot of extra roll cage. So if a car tries to what we call T-bone me, driving my door there accidentally, I'm well protected. So that's safety. What are the tools that the driver has at his disposal? Well, three pedals, clutch, brake and accelerator, just like your road car or your manual road car. A steering wheel that is covered with buttons and a little computer. Now, when you look where I'm seated here, obviously, and I sit a long way back, I can't reach buttons and dials all over the dash. So basically, everything is brought onto the steering wheel. So all the controls are there and much more. There's a little computer here that gives me a readout of all sorts of information, lap time, the time I'm targeting, all the temperatures, alarms and warnings. I can reset those, so basically do everything. And there's a whole lot of little lights on here. Lights for shifting gears, so I know when to shift gears. They prompt me. And lights for when I lock up my brakes, which I don't want to do, so I get a warning. Um, so, so a lot of information there. Now, I talked about gears. Here's our gear stick. Now, you're wondering, it's not an automatic. It's not a H pattern like an old style manual, it's what's called sequential. And what sequential basically means is you can just keep pulling it and changing gear in one direction and then back the other way. One, two, three, four, five, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now, these two levers, we talk a lot about them in the telecast. Anti-roll bars, red for rear, the blue one is the front one. I won't bore you with the detail, we'll do that later. But basically, they're the driver's ability to tune the car in the race. How soft and hard he wants the front or the rear of the car. Really important. And the other little tuning device he's got on the fly is this thing, his brake bias. So he can determine how much of his brake energy is at the front of the car or the rear of the car. Really important as your tyres wear and your fuel load goes away in a race. Now all this instrumentation, very intentionally, is right in my line of sight because as I said, I sit right down low in the car comparative to a road car. In fact, I'm only looking, you can see there, through the bottom couple of inches of my windscreen. Now, when you're traveling at 300 k's an hour, I need to see hundreds of meters up the road. And at best, I reckon I can see 20 meters. So there's no way I could park this thing in a Woolies car park without hitting something. So there you have it, that's a supercar. That was a big story, but we got plenty more episodes coming. But you know what? I'm keen to hear what you want to know. So jump on 7 Sports Twitter, hashtag supercars101, ask your question. Cheers. Supercars 101, brought to you by NTI, Australia's specialist insurer.